What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another college basketball show here on the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. She is Abby Schnabel. I am Noah Hiles. Abby, we said there wasn't a lot of good college basketball being played in <laughs> Pittsburgh a week ago. I guess they heard us because uh, Robert Morris won, I think, after I said that. They're in three game streak. Yeah, right they've won three straight. Duquesne got its first Atlantic 10 win, and Pitt has won back to back games in the ACC, including a win Saturday over uh, number seven Duke in Durham. Um, I know we got a show format, but you said you wanted to ask me a couple questions on that uh, I just, just in the professional setting. And then, then you might have some questions off air as well that, you know, some off the record stuff. But what did, what did you have to ask about that one? I just, I mean, playing at Duke, that arena is just legendary. And so yeah. having not been there, having um, – Pitt come in and upset. I just want to know what it was like. What was the atmosphere like with the crazies right behind you? The Blake Hinson moment. Like it just was a pic- picturesque from me watching it on my couch. So I just wanted to know what it was like being in person. Yeah. I mean, I've been there twice now and both times it's, it's kind of surreal just being there. Cause it's so small. Like you go to a place like football stadiums. I've been to some cool football stadiums, but, and they're more, coveted as cathedrals you know these big gigantic things that you go in and you stand on the field and you look around and you're kind of amazed with how big it is I mean North Allegheny High School is bigger than Cameron Indoor Stadium their gym and and so you're kind of you're but you're you're overwhelmed by the banners the retired jerseys the highlights the traditions and and then of course the student section which is right on top of you and uh it was loud um, I'll be honest. I did not expect that to be a close game. I thought Duke is <laughs> a 13 point favorite was a pretty generous line. Um, and I, I completely expected even in the beginning when Pitt opened, I believe on a nine Oh run, I was like, this isn't going to last because we'd seen that before they started hot against North Carolina too. Um, but man, I mean, they just never went away. And so the whole time, you're just kind of locked in on what's happening. It's it's hard to really take into account because I mean this is a really good Duke team this year. I wouldn't be shocked if it went to you know at least the second weekend uh, of the tournament, and you're just watching it all unfold and you're just thinking there's there's no way this can happen, right? And uh, just the way we saw Federico step up, obviously. I mean the Blake Hinton shots were just <laughs> unbelievable. Um, and then Jalen Lowe too, just the, the shots he made down the stretch, especially the one against Philip How- over top of Filipowski in the final minute. It was, uh, I mean, and, and, you know, that's, that was the first time it reminded me of last year's team mm-hmm. where you just would watch and you're just like, I can't believe this is happening. And there were <laughs> a lot of those moments last year. And it was the first time it felt like that this year where it's like, oh, this, this is what. Jeff had in mind for his team and um it was cool I mean obviously the Blake post game stuff was unreal uh, it happened probably 30 feet down from where I was sitting I have a great video of it on my Twitter you could still look it up it's like my final score tweet um and uh y- you don't like that's a moment and Blake's hit big shots for Pitt a lot of people will say you know he might be remembered most for his logo three against Mississippi State against Dayton um, or just, you know, some of the big shots he made in the regular season last year. But I, 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 I he, that's gotta be his defining moment here. Mm-hmm. Unless if he, you know, hit some buzzer beaters to win pit some games in the ACC tournament or, even, or March madness again, I still don't know if there's going to be a more defining moment about mm-hmm. Blake Henson than that. Him standing on the scores table at half court and just looking those Cameron crazies in the eye. It was unbelievable. It was it was a really, really cool thing that um, regardless of how this season plays out, Pitt fans are going to talk about that oh, moment, absolutely. that game forever. That's going to be a trivia question, and that's one where I don't know if I'll be covering this team for another five years or 50 years or something less or in between. That's going to go down as one of the more memorable things that I've seen on this beat. So mm-hmm. that's the way I would describe it. So. I love but, it. It was yeah. it was so fun to watch. Like uh, there were some frustrations going on Twitter with the referees and everything. That's always going to happen. Yeah. But it was just like it was just 
It's the first time I felt like I was sitting on the edge of my seat for a pick game this right. year. And like, I don't know, like you, you opened the podcast with, we haven't really gotten that in Pittsburgh college basketball this year. Um, and then, you know, for the fact that we were spoiled with not only, you know, we talked about it last week on the podcast, Penn State getting a win over a ranked Wisconsin team. Then West Virginia follows it up with a win over a ranked um, Kansas team, number Kansas three. Team, yeah. And then later that day, Pitt pulls off a ranked win over Duke. Like, it was just, they the, the basketball gods listened to our complaints. And, it, you know, I would not have imagined this is what we would be talking about a week from, our, or if you took me back a week. But mm -hmm. you love to see it. Love to see it. You know, Abby, my new complaint is I, I have never won the lottery. And I'm never going <laughs> to. Uh, I'm never going to win any of my bets uh, in the NFL playoffs. <laughs> it's just never going to happen. But we'll get into the show now. Now we have a question, a highlight, and a prediction. We start off with the question, and it pertains to Pitt. Who is now, I believe what twelve and seven overall, and se uh, and three and five in the ACC? Uh, it's still in, you know the bottom third of those standings, but it's it's quickly rising. And uh, my question to you is, Abby, is it okay for Pitt fans to start getting excited again? And when I say excited, I mean you can enjoy wins, but a week ago we were talking about how this team's not going to make the NCAA tournament, and I still don't think that this team's going to make the NCAA tournament. But w at what point in time in the season is it appropriate? How many? How long does this win streak have to last before Pitt fans can get excited again? And and you know we're we're doing the whole bubble thing like we did last <laughs> year. Yeah, um, I said last week that they needed they should go out and just cause chaos because they didn't really have anything to lose, and I didn't expect that to happen against a Duke team like that but you know it put them back maybe on the bubble of being on the bubble of being on the bubble three three bubbles removed from the NCAA tournament um I don't think they're completely out of the conversation especially when you consider that the ACC isn't having a banner year this year you've got I mean Duke and UNC absolutely demolishing the competition more often than not but like I don't know I think it's fair to start getting like like excited in a a little bit, but I need to see it sustained a little bit more. Two wins is great, but can they do it at home? And that's something we'll talk about later. Like we our prediction question has to do with home and away games, but um, I mean, I don't know if they're they're I I think they're hitting their they're getting to their stride. They're not there yet, and here's why I say that is um, Blake Henson's still playing pretty inconsistent. When you yeah. take away the, I mean, seven for seven at Duke, 24 points, insane. But you take away that, his numbers fluctuate a lot. Um, right. I mean, nine against the, Duke, in the last four games, that's what I'm going to use as my reference. I don't know why I picked the last four games, but here no, we are. No, that's a good sample size. So, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, nine uh, uh, against Duke at home, 12 against Syracuse, 24 at Duke, and then nine against Georgia Tech. You want to see that number a little bit more consistent and definitely in the double digits for a guy like Blake Hinson. And then continuing it down, you look at Bob Carrington. I feel like he's in a little bit of a slump right now. Maybe not after the Georgia Tech game. Right. I was grateful to see him get the 19 points, but you look at his last four games and he's 10, 0, 9, and 19. And, and he he's not a guy you want in being in a little bit of a drought right now. Um the one bright spot that I see that makes me think, yes, they're hitting their stride is Jalen Lowe. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 9, 20, 17, 12. Like, it's just, it's frustrating. And, and I say this about Duquesne all the time. It's frustrating because you can see the pieces. But for some reason, the pieces are not aligning. And that's why I'm like, I don't know if you can get excited yet. There are players you can get excited about and moments you can get excited about. But I think it's going to take a couple more wins, definitely more wins at home, before we can really be like, oh, they they might be back in conversation. And so, I don't know. I think you have to win at Miami. And then I'd like to see them and go 3-0 and at home. I, I mean, Wake Forest, Notre Dame, NC State. Wake Forest and NC State are, are doing pretty well, but – you know, Wake Forest is one and three on, on the road. So uh, all of those are wins. And then maybe after, if they can win all four of those, maybe then I'm like, okay, let's get excited. But right now, I just I just don't think the pieces have connected. So NC State's a road game. 
Uh, oh, but sorry. No worries. No worries. Um, because I was like, did I did I just book an Airbnb nope. in a rental car for no reason? No, um, I just <laughs> forgot to write the app. <laughs> yes. No, but. I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, I think that there, aside from the guys that you highlighted, I think there are players that are kind of finding their roles right now. Um, I really, and I know Fetty Federico needs to be more consistent. That's probably the most inconsistent guy on the team right now. Um, but I love Guillermo's role off the bench as a guy who can come in and provide some offense and then length on the defensive side. And Ishmael Leggett is almost Nike Sabande 2.0, except he can't dunk, you know, or, I mean, maybe he can, but he can't dunk like Nike can dunk. Uh, mm -hmm. But, and uh, I mean, no offense by that ish, if you hear me say that, but uh, they have a really good six man guard that they can run a three guard rotation with later in the game. Um, so the rules are starting to get defined. Here's what I would say. I think that if Pitt can finish the month with two more wins, it has two more games this month at Miami, and, at, and home against Wake Forest. Miami is virtually the same team on paper as Pitt right now. Mm -hmm. They're one spot apart in the in either Ned or Ken Palm, and in the other, they're like two spots apart. They're right beside each other in the, the conference standings, and their overall records aren't drastically different either. Yeah, Pitt is 12 and 7, Miami's 12 and 6, Miami's 3 and 4 in the ACC, Pitt is 3 and 5. And these were two teams that were looked at as, you know, middle of the pack. Miami was actually supposed to be probably the third best team in this league this year. So I, I, I think that you can't lose that one because you're kind of fighting against yourself there as far as perception from the outside world. You, you don't want to lose the hierarchy ground there. Um, and then Wake Forest right now is the fourth best team in the league. So that would be, that would be their best home win of the season. Mm -hmm. If they if they end January with a win over Wake Forest, that puts them at five and five in ACC play. That gives them a, a decent overall record at fourteen and seven, I believe. Or would that be thirteen and seven? No, it'd be fourteen and seven because they're they're twelve and seven right now. Yeah, right? they're twelve and seven that. right yeah, now. Yeah, so they'd be fourteen and seven. However, that's the time to get excited. The mm -hmm. time when Pitt, in my opinion, will be truly back on the bubble. Be a team that we see brought up by DeCourcy, Lenardi, Jerry Palm, all of these guys, um, is Valentine's Day. You look at their next five games in total. I already talked about Wake Forest and Miami. Notre Dame is a game that's going to be a quad four game at home. You cannot lose that. Mm -hmm. And that's a team that beat Pitt last year. Mm -hmm. And there's a really good coach on the opposite sideline. <laughs> So that's a team that could be coming in looking to play spoiler. You have to beat the Fighting Irish, who I think are probably the second worst team in the league this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have two tough challenges against NC State and Virginia, who they're kind of in a spot where Pitt finds itself. And also maybe Miami and Wake Forest. The battle over the next three weeks is going to come down to who can clearly establish themselves as the fourth best team in the ACC. Because mm -hmm. right now it's Duke and North Carolina in their own stratosphere. And then Clemson is kind of at the head of the rest of the, the helm, right? And so Wake Forest has a really good chance to, to assert itself. If it can come into Pittsburgh next week and win, and if it can do handle its own business. But if Pitt can win this next five games, and I understand that's an incredibly tall task <laughs> because it just won back-to-back -back ACC games for the first time yesterday. Yep. But <clears throat> if it wins its next five, that's two more quad one wins, two more quad two victories, and just two more wins on its home floor. All things that you really want to see from a tournament team. That mm -hmm. would bring its overall record to 17 and seven and eight and five in the conference with about a month until conference tournament time. Um, and I think by that point in the season, it will be pretty well established that Pitt is the fourth best team in the ACC. Mm -hmm. And I think regardless of whatever bracketology you see right now, <clears throat> there will be four teams from the ACC yeah. in this tournament. Even if one of them's in Dayton, I just, there's no way that it's only going to be a three team thing. Yeah. One of these teams, be it Wake Forest, Miami, Pitt, uh, Virginia Tech, NC State, Virginia, one of them's going to figure it out and, and sneak in. Mm -hmm. And Pitt can be that fourth team. 
or at least put itself in a spot where it's viewed as that fourth team with a month remaining in the regular season. It's just got to win its next five. And that's a big gotta, right? That's a big, tall, yeah. a tall task. But I think the excitement, there's a reason to be legitimately excited if it can win its next two. Because mm-hmm. the Miami is a thing where you're you're going up against a team that, based off of pretty much every metric, is equally as good as you are. And then next week when you face Wake Forest, you're playing the team that you want to swap spots with yep. in the national uh, the national point of view. So mm-hmm. then after that, you've got to win an easier game at home. And then probably two of your, I'd say two of your four hardest remaining road games on the year. So mm-hmm. that's what's going to have to come of it. But I mean, that's just, that's the situation they put itself in. Pitt needs, like I said, yep. Pitt needs to prove that it's the fourth best team in the ACC right now. And it has a real good chance to do that because it's four of its next five games are against teams that are trying to do the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. So we'll move on to the highlight. We're going to highlight a guy on Duquesne, uh, a guy that Abby just wrote a feature on um, and a guy that I know very well from my previous uh career or my previous outlet that I worked for um, Jake DeMichael for Duquesne, a guy who, if you're a high school basketball fan in this area, you should be more than familiar with uh, <laughs> one of the top whippy players of all time was on the winningest team uh, in the history of the pencil or PI double a one. What was it? Two straight state titles, three straight whippy titles um, four. or four, four straight whippy titles. Excuse me. He was the first freshman to ever start in four whippy championship mm-hmm. games. Um, I, I covered a lot of Jake's high school career at the Beaver County times. He and I built a pretty good relationship and with that whole team with Dante Spadafora running the point and coach Rodriguez and all of it. It was, it was some, some of the best high school basketball that I've covered. Um, and I was always confused as to what would next, what would be next for Jake? Because Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a clear hooper, but because he played at such a low level in this area, it's really hard for scouts to take you seriously and yeah. even what you do in AAU. Um, but he ends up finding his footing and now as a walk on at Duquesne, he's a starter and a contributor. So mm-hmm. Abby, I'll let you take it away. Tell me more about Jake DeMichael. Yeah. Not only did he have to battle with, you know, playing at a low level at high school, but you also got to think his, um, I, it would have been his sophomore year was the COVID year. Mm -hmm. Um, which was incredibly difficult to be scouted at in general with um, the COVID year. So even if he was, when he was putting up numbers that would have been scouted, coaches weren't, couldn't travel. And then you also have to take into consideration uh, while his junior and senior year was right around the time that the transfer portal and stuff started coming out. And the COVID year. So all these guys and got the this COVID extra, year. yeah, got so this extra he, eligibility. So he he fell he fell victim to a lot of different things because I truly believe like he likely if you fa- you rewind a couple years he would have been getting D one looks and yeah. and that's what that's what um prep coach uh Bergeron of First Love Academy he um he said is this guy is a D one player he's just a victim of circumstance right now so uh you know Jake had a Offer from a D2 school, he asked to, or he wanted to leave unnamed, went to accept it after making a championship run, and they said, sorry, we gave it to someone else, because they, he was waiting, he was focused on his high school career, and he was heartbroken, and then so he decides to go to First Love Prep Academy, and it ended up being a a game changer for him, he adds 10 to 15 pounds, he learns a lot more about how to be a good player out of high school he learns the college game he learns how to play against guys that are bigger than him i mean you got to think he's he's six four he was the tallest guy in most of his uh, high school games yeah. he goes he goes first love um academy and he is he has two teammates that are six ten. so he's learning 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 a lot and he starts getting offers um but the two things, the biggest thing is he he wanted to be close to home. He's a big family guy, as Noah knows. Um, yeah. uh, he wanted to be close to home, and he grew up going to Duquesne games. So Keith Dambrot offers him a spot and is like, look, it's a preferred walk-on spot. I can't give you a full ride. We can get you an academic scholarship because he's a very intelligent guy. Yep. Um, and so he decides the whole thing he kept saying is, is God's plan, and I wanted to bet on myself. And he started on the scout team. 
but he loved it. Like most people would not love scouting uh, being on the scout team, but when you're playing against guys like Day Day Grant, Jimmy Clark the third, and and Kareem Rosier, you're learning a lot. And you know it paid off because Loyola Chicago. I remember sitting there watching, like, wait, who is this guy? We had seen little to no, no, like he came in at the end of the game or when when Day Day yeah. really needed a break. You just didn't see him, and then all of a sudden he goes in against Loyola and he scores seven points, and then he comes in against Dayton. And the Dayton game is what I have like starred as his breakout moment for me. Right. Because obviously career high 12 points against an insanely good Dayton team. Um, and yes, they lost that game. And so there's a little bit of an asterisk on everything just with the fact that they lost, but that does not diminish the fact that he um, scored 12 points in 20 minutes against Dayton. And then not only that, but stole the ball from Nate Santos and Javon Bennett, two of their starting guards. This freshman came mm-hmm. in and did that. And I think that's my favorite thing about him is you can tell, and the players and coach uh, Dan Brott talk about this all the time, is he is not afraid. He does not feel like there is anything to lose. He's going to make the most of every single opportunity. Sometimes it backfires. Like last night, he went to steal the ball and ended up getting called on a foul. Um, But other times, you know, it it works. Like St. Bonaventure, uh, finally they get their first win. He only scores seven points. Granted, his points came at a time that extended the lead to 16 points, which they ended up needing the cushion. No one was scoring in that game. No. (laughs) It was brutal. (laughs) Um, But he, he gets three steals, four rebounds. Yeah, four rebounds in the last three games. And so it's just been so fun to watch this guy. You don't see a lot of walk-ons getting big minutes in Division One basketball to begin with. Nevertheless, it's taking advantage of um, starting. Like when Day Day Grant goes out with a concussion, he, I mean, uh, uh, Jake said to me, I was heartbroken. I don't want Day Day out. But at the same time, it was, he had earned the spot. And we've seen that he's able to help defensively. He's a menace. Um, Offensively, he's still getting there. He's not as confident as he could be, but he's just been a huge bright spot in a um, Duquesne team that's really struggled. Um, And you can see that the guys are rallying around him in a way because he brings this energy. He doesn't get really high. He doesn't get really low. You say that about a lot of players, but usually you're not saying that until they're seniors or, or around that Jake comes in, he does his job. Does he make mistakes? Absolutely. But it's just, it's been so fun to watch and you can just tell that he cares and just wants to do everything he can. And he might've had um, the biggest smile um, after the win. I say, I always say that because, you know, Kareem Rosier and Jimmy Clark probably had the biggest reactions, but Jake had just the biggest smile when they finally got that win. And so it's just been really cool to see this, this abnormal path to um, becoming a starter for a Division One team. Um, and it, it's it's fun to see, and I'm sure for you too, it's fun to see this kid finally get some good looks. It is. I mean, for part of it was I was confused because I'm like, you got a cousin coaching or playing in half the schools in the country. I mean, the, the Michaels <laughs> are everywhere. Yeah. So it's like, how in the world are you not getting recruited? But I, I understood it. Um, and this is, this is something that I think a lot of Whippeal kids should pay attention to. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because, I mean... This isn't an area where you're bound to go power five if you dominate. Yeah. You've got, I mean, and I get that it's it's becoming something where you look at what Lincoln Park has and you look at Adutiero right now playing for Kentucky, and there have been plenty of other examples. Ethan Morton on on Purdue, Purdue. Um, and, and there are some examples, and more recently than there have been over the past, you know, when I was in high school ten years ago or so, um, but. Jake is a guy that, yes, it's, you can make something happen here. You you can, mm-hmm. if you work for it and you go the Juco route and, and like you said, Abby, I mean, watching him, covering him and I covered, I covered Morton. I covered Fierro. I covered mm-hmm. all of these guys. I've covered Cummings. I've covered both Cummings is I've covered <laughs> uh, Malik Thomas. And, and I don't think that Jake's necessarily better than some of those guys I named, but I would watch it. I would say there, there's no way this guy couldn't play at Robert Morris or mm-hmm. at a at a mid major. And Brayden Reynolds, another guy who's playing at um Fairleigh Dickinson, the team that beat Purdue last year. And, and 
I would watch it and I'd say, you know, Jay could do that too. And that's not, mm-hmm. not a slight against anyone I just named. I just think he is a player on their yep. level. And I think a lot of those guys who saw him play would agree with me. And mm-hmm. it was it was a tough thing that he had to deal with and a lot of other kids had to deal with too, where if you weren't already verbally committed, because there were some kids in the area who did commit early. And there were some kids who just through connections were able to find that mm-hmm. that that in. Um but Jake wasn't, and it, it was frustrating for him, uh, and he made it through. And I think that this is going to be a guy – I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say he's going to end up as like an all-time great in Duquesne, and I have no idea what he will achieve there and what Duquesne will achieve with him there. Um, but he's a guy that I don't think you'd have to worry about going into the portal mm-hmm. and a guy that will perform for that yeah. team for four years. So and, good and for I him and good for Duquesne. I think another cool thing that came out of it was learning about the prep system because prep, mm-hmm. uh, your your postgraduate prep year doesn't count against your eligibility. He's still a freshman. Right. Um, and when you think of other players that have done prep years, Fetty Federico right. um, at First Love, um, and then the, arguably the biggest name is Trey Mitchell at Kentucky right now. And so it's mm-hmm. kind of cool seeing this this new path break out in, in this era of transfer portal and everything. So, yes. So good on Jake DeMichael. Uh, you know, I'd also got to give our shout out, Jake and I have the same barber. So shout out to Xander over in Bellevue. Uh, if you want to go over to the <laughs> Bellevue barber shop, he does a good job. So I got to give him a shout out. He's my guy, aside from Abby's articles and watching Jake on TV, he gives me the insight on what's going on with Jake every time I get my hair cut. So shout out to Xander. All right. We wrap up the show with a prediction every time, Abby, I got to ask you right now, Pitt is four and one on the road this season, seven and five at home. Will Pitt finish the regular season with a better road or home winning percentage? Granted, there are, I would say, I think every quad one game remaining on Pitt's schedule right now is on the road. So its toughest challenges, theoretically, are away from the Peterson Event Center. Uh, But will Pitt have a better winning percentage at home on the road? I will say the road, especially Mm -hmm. if this team is going to make the tournament. It's going to have to be, they're going to have to be road dogs. And this team, I thought, played pretty well on the road last year. It had some decent wins. It's big wins came at home. Um, but yeah, I, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with the road as uh the the area where Pitt has more success. The mathematical route makes me say road, and mm-hmm. I think road. I feel like their home games are easier for sure, but I just feel like we haven't seen them play well at home yet. And that makes me want to lean towards a way. Like you said, they're road dogs. They want to go out there. They want to upset the home crowd. And I think they, 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 I think they get more from upsetting the home crowd than they do um, playing in front of their crowd. Yeah. And so that makes me stay away. And also when you just look at it already being seven and five at home, being four and one away mathematically, it just makes me think away. Um, it'll be close though. I definitely think it will be close. Um, and I'm hoping they get some of those home wins because they need them if they want to get back in the bubble. Yes, they do. All right, Abby, any final thoughts as we wrap up another show? Nope. All good. Nope. All good. Nope. Abby, Abby is ready to <laughs> wind down. All right. For Abby Schnabel, I'm Noah Hiles. Thank you for tuning in. As always, we'll have more college basketball talk every Thursday here on the Post-Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network where you can get all of your Pittsburgh sports coverage by the Post-Gazette Sports Department. Take care. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>